Coming up on Market to Market. The Japanese agree to buy American, while the Chinese keep purchasing U.S. commodities without a trade deal. The flip side of a bomb cyclone brings relief and a gut punch. And market analysis with Dan Huber, next. Higher steady to higher prices, so certainly we could go through. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com. This is the Friday, September 27 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Delaney Howell. The longest economic expansion on record, now in year 11, is largely supported by consumer spending and the lowest unemployment rate in nearly 50 years. A prolonged trade war with China, however, may slam the brakes on the oversized load of business investment and manufacturing. The outlook of the vital American consumer is at its lowest level in three months, but is still historically high. New home sales jumped 7% last month as buyers took advantage of lower interest rates. Orders for big-ticket manufactured goods like cars, computers, or planes increased slightly in August, even with a drop in the commercial aircraft sector. Soybeans, pork, and intellectual property issues remain deadlocked in talks with China, set to resume again next week, but not before new movement with another one of our Asian trading partners. Peter Tubbs reports. A trade deal with Japan promises lower tariffs on both sides of the Pacific. Under this agreement, we together will be able to bring benefits to everyone in Japan, as well as in the United States, namely consumers, producers and workers. So the outcome of this negotiation is actually a win-win solution for Japan and the United States. The agreement gives the U.S. enhanced market access to its third largest trading partner. The deal reduces or eliminates tariffs on 7.2 billion in agricultural products almost half of the 14 billion imported by the Japanese annually. Over 5 billion worth of imports were already duty-free. Tariffs on beef and pork will be reduced in stages, but the exact timeline has yet to be announced. Other agricultural products will see their tariffs reduced immediately. Wheat will still face a quota limit on the amount that can be exported to the island nation. The deal also reduces import taxes on software and digital media that is traded between the two countries. The U.S. exports roughly twice the value of pork to Japan than to China and is the second largest destination for pork products after Mexico. The National Pork Producers Council expects 2% growth in sales to Japan per year over the next 15 years. Other trade categories, most notably the import and export of cars, will be discussed during the next stage of negotiations. According to the U.S. Meat Export Federation, with Japan being the largest value destination for U.S. pork and beef exports, there is no market more critical to the profitability and prosperity of the U.S. red meat industry. It is therefore imperative that we achieve a level playing field for U.S. pork and beef in Japan so that the U.S. industry can further expand its customer base in this increasingly competitive market. The National Pork Producers Council says, We've seen market share declines in Japan, historically our largest value export market, since the start of the year when international competitors gained more favorable access through new trade agreements. Once implemented, the agreement signed today puts U.S. pork back on a level playing field with our competitors in Japan. The deal with Japan spurred hope for progress on USMCA. The NAFTA replacement has been stalled in the House over Democratic concerns about labor standards, enforceability, and pharmaceutical costs. We just received word earlier this week that uh, Lighthizer is going to continue his negotiations 
with a small group of House Democrats to work out differences on uh, environment, labor, and enforcement. Late in the week, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi assured lawmakers that work on USMCA will move ahead. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Widespread weekend rains ended much of the flash drought across the Midwest last week, but didn't relieve conditions in the southeast. During mid-March, a low-pressure system spread from the southwest to the Great Lakes, bringing blizzard conditions, hurricane-force winds, heavy rains, and flooding. While those in the Midwest were left to helplessly watch water roll over their levees, the rain was initially welcomed in other parts of the country. Josh Bittner reports in our cover story. When the now infamous bomb cyclone ripped through the Midwest in early 2019, the massive storm blazed a trail for historic spring flooding, <sighs> leading many Corn Belt farmers to plant spring crops late, or not at all. But in arid climates, like the Four Corners region of Utah, the weather phenomenon brought a reprieve from business as usual. Although for some, the saturation kicked off a roller coaster ride. We had a really heavy winter and a good spring, and so we came onto our range this past spring, and it was great. The, the green that was growing up through here, you know, through April and May was, was better than we had ever seen it. But a few months before that, all this summer grass, this warm season grass, there was nothing. And this is all new growth. Sean Ivins and his brother Tyler run 300 head of cattle in San Juan County. Their allotment stretches from the peaks of the Abajo Mountains, locally known as the Blue Mountains, down to the desert terrain of Butler Wash. But due to ongoing drought, the brothers sold off a third of their herd in 2018. USDA precipitation data shows the area averaged less than three inches between January and May during over 15 years prior. In 2019, during the same span, over five inches fell on the region, 181 percent above normal. All that moisture through the winter, both down on the desert and up on the mountain, spurred a lot of growth of plants. Ivan says the minerals and proteins cows get foraging brush cuts down on the cost of having to feed their herd supplements. But this year's flourish allowed some seeds, dormant in the soil for years or even decades, to spread like wildfire. The Indian rice grass. Chief among them was larkspur, a tall flower from the buttercup family. While appetizing to grazers, the plant packs a toxic bovine gut punch. A lot of the ranchers were moving the cows into areas, not even expecting to see the, the poison there, or even knew that it was possible that it would grow there. The seeds, you know, we've never seen them in our lifetime. Without even knowing, we put cows into an area. The ranchers say they knew something was wrong when 10% of the cattle they drove up through a pasture on their allotment died over a mile-long stretch. One local rancher sent samples of the plant to USDA's poisonous plant laboratory in Logan, confirming the community's suspicions. We're we familiar with larkspur, and we've seen it. We've dealt with it, you know, up higher on the mountain, and so we knew what it was, but we were very surprised to see it come up down on the winter range. The flowers were not even blooming out yet, and so we didn't even know it was really there, and we didn't kidding. know it could grow down there, and then all of a sudden it bloomed out, and it bloomed out everywhere. It wasn't just in our area. It was all over, and so it wasn't like you could move them from one place to another because it was everywhere. By working with the U.S. Forest Service, which administers their summer range grazing permit, the Ivans were able to get a handle on things by rotating cattle into other grazing areas later than usual, giving the larkspur a chance to dry out and lose toxicity. The process typically takes a week or two, but this year the Ivans has spent six weeks safeguarding their investments, roughly $2,500 annually for each cow-calf pair. For cattle displaying characteristic symptoms of bloating, foaming at the mouth, and loss of motor functions, death is all but certain, though some do avoid consuming fatal doses and may slowly recover. It has an alkaloid in it, and so inevitably it starts to prevent neurotransmitters from functioning, and eventually the cattle will 
uh, start to have respiratory problems and eventually it leads to death just from the respiratory system uh, collapsing and so they basically end up suffocating. Reagan White Salusi is an assistant professor with Utah State Extension in nearby Monticello. She says social media posts revealed local enthusiasm for the bloom of color rarely seen in the area before the public was educated about the downside of Larkspur. This year we just had a lot of snowpack. Even into July we still had some snow up there. It's kind of a win and lose battle with the weather here right now. White Salusi adds the weather anomaly which filled parched reservoirs, eventually gave way to drought. The lack of moisture led local dryland farmers like John Johnson, who also encountered larkspur with his herd, to wait out Mother Nature or risk losing precious topsoil. We can't plant wheat. It's too dry to plant. It's all part of farming in this country. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. So. But that's the way we live it, right here in this area. As for larkspur, agricultural authorities have found letting sheep graze ahead of cattle tramples plants, making them less appetizing. Unlike their larger ruminant cousins, sheep also metabolize the alkaloid faster and have fewer gastrointestinal problems. But for the Ivins brothers, who say larkspur can still be found on cooler and wetter north-facing slopes in the Manti LaSalle National Forest, 2019 was a lesson learned the hard way. There's real no cure for it. You just kind of have to hope they didn't get the lethal dose. And, and if they did, then it's within hours they, they die. I mean, it's, it's pretty quick. Definitely we'll be watching for it in years to come. <laughs> for Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Dry weather coupled with pre-report positioning offset dramatic moves in the markets. For the week, December wheat improved three cents while the nearby corn contract gained a penny. Near perfect weather to finish the soybean crop limited the soy complex as the November soybean contract was even. December meal increased a dime per ton. December cotton rose 38 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, October Class 3 milk futures lost 50 cents. Trade news bolstered the livestock sector as December cattle jumped 11.23, November feeders put on 3.78, and the December lean hog contract rocketed 9.50, a 16% jump. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained 61 ticks. November crude oil shed 2.48 per barrel. COMEX Gold decreased 14.10 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell more than six points to finish at 4.10.60. Joining us now to offer insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Dan Huber. Dan, welcome back. Thanks very much. Great to be here. A surprise guest, but we're glad to have there you go. nonetheless. I, I always jump at a chance to come to Iowa. So. <laughs> well, fantastic. Very good. Dan, I want to talk about what you saw in your journey to Iowa, but mm -hmm. first let's talk here about really the winner, it seems like, in the grain markets this week, and it's the wheat markets. Are they having a turnaround? Well, you know, it's certainly encouraging action. In fact, you know, up for the week, but actually if you look back a little further, this is the fourth week in a row of higher closes in wheat. Uh, we haven't really launched through any critical levels of resistance yet, but I think there's just enough factors happening right now with, uh, you know, concerns not only of of maybe a little reduction in our crop, but I mean, we a lot of more news out of South America, uh, the dry weather, and actually an early frost, or let me say an, an unusual frost in Argentina, and the dry conditions down there, it seems to be trimming back ideas for the wheat estimates there. And then in, our, in Australia, here once again, facing a severe drought down there, the latest forecast from the uh, Meteorological Bureau in Australia say, you know, another 30 day, or another 60 days, maybe 90 days, of uh, lack of moisture and an unseasonably warm temperatures. So again, they're pulling back on that crop size. So, you know, overall, just enough news there to kind of prop it up. And I think, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, some idea that, you know, maybe the demand is going to be picking up from, from uh, even domestically on some of the feed sources and whatnot. So, uh, you know, enough news to lift us off the lows, thankfully. 
You mentioned their resistance levels. Let's talk about the December Chicago contract in particular. Dan, mm -hmm. where are you looking at for a level of resistance right now? Well, I think a critical level is just below the $5 mark. In fact, uh, 494 and a half, I think it's about a 50% retracement of the entire range for this last summer. Now, if we could start pushing and closing above there, the picture changes pretty pretty quickly. Uh, right now, I guess I'm just a little hesitant to think that it's, it's quite ready. I mean, I, I think ultimately we're going to do it. When you look at the long-term picture, and weed, yes, it looks like we're probably forming a bottom, and uh, we've got some higher prices uh, down the road. But boy, the next 30, 60 days yet, you know, particularly with the harvest of uh, corn and soybeans coming on, could be that limiting factor that uh, really keeps us from pushing through there just yet. Well, Dan, you led me right to it the harvest of corn and soybeans that's on the mind of Certainly. so many folks in your drive here to Iowa today from Illinois. Did you see a lot of combines rolling? Or are you seeing people well, getting in the field? Well, of course, I saw mostly rain across. I mean, I, Illinois, especially, was raining pretty hard in Illinois. Uh, just enough in, I, in Iowa that, you know, certainly there wasn't going to be anybody out in the field. Uh, interesting enough, on the entire trip, I saw two soybean fields that were done, that were mm -hmm. gone. Uh, but that was it. You know, most of them were, you know, in various stages of, uh, of, of uh, maturity. Corn, you know, I, I suppose there's been some, maybe some corn for uh, silage, silage taken out. But outside of that, I would, I would suspect we're going to be another uh, two to three weeks away from the, for the majority of the corn. I know in our area... The uh, er, you know, and again, it's a very limited amount of acreage. There was a little corn planted in April, and uh, I uh, if if we dry out, which uh, that doesn't look real promising here for the next week, but if we dry out, I think the uh, those fields will be tried. But uh, a week ago, I know some guys checked fields that were midday April planted, still about 35 percent moisture. So you know, particularly at these price levels, nobody's in a hurry to try to increase expenses if they can avoid it. So definitely, definitely. And Dan, there have been a lot of factors we've been. Looking at here, really mm -hmm. since the WASD report dropped sure. a couple weeks ago, we've got a question here from Terry on mm -hmm. Twitter wanting to know the corn basis currently is 30 to 50 cents higher in a lot of areas than the five-year mm -hmm. across the boards. How is this indicative of a 2.4 billion carryout? Yeah. Well, and, and very good question, but I think you know a couple different factors that uh, have really impacted that. One, uh, just the, the, the direction in prices this year. Really, since spring, there's been very few opportunities to uh, to move bushels or, or at least uh, into into good price levels. And I think farmers have tended to sit on bushels at home. Uh, so the pipeline is relatively uh, r relatively short here at this point in time. Uh, take it a step further. The uh, I, I think there's a number of people who have been so concerned about their crop and what the availability is going to be that they've maybe held back some of the old crop bushels either for blending uh, possibilities or for uh, you know feed needs and this type of thing. So it's it, it, you know I can speak from our uh, from our usage at the feed mill or availability at the feed mill. You know a year ago at this time. You know, corn was just running out of the woodworks, you know, and everybody wanted to get to get stores empty, was ready for a big new crop coming on. You know, with the question mark exactly how much corn there's going to be this year harvested, I think people have been just a little more, a little stingy on uh, on emptying those bins here at this point in time. So the net result is better basis levels than we're expected, and then push harvest back two or three weeks, and uh, you know, it, the, all, all of us combined to keep those levels b uh, better. Now, one final note to throw in there: you look at the spreads. Uh, the future spreads, they're still relatively wide, you know, so the market is still anticipating, you know, a, a decent amount of carry in the market and will take advantage of that if, that if they can. Uh, but with very little corn in the books, you know, they, uh, they always get a little bit anxious about getting some inventory books so they can hedge it and uh, start earning something on that storage. So. Okay. Dan, the other big story this week in the grain markets was the almost million ton purchase of soybeans Certainly. from China, but it didn't seem to give the markets a bounce. Well, you know, and, and I think we've seen this so many times this year where you start approaching uh, trade negotiations. Uh, there's lots of talk. China's going to come in. We're going to buy lots of quantities of beans. Uh, we see that happen. And then, of course, really, the, the, we see the talks fall apart again. So I, I think we've been kind of become numb to uh, when with this happens. Now, really, the news, and we know there's been a little over a million metric tons put, purchased this week. There is t really talk out of uh, Shanghai and those areas that up to 6 million metric tons may be purchased coming into the uh, negotiations here mm -hmm. in the next week. So, uh, you know, that, that's well known in the marketplace. But, but still, I mean, that is a, a significant rebound from, of course, you know, nothing uh, throughout most of the uh, summer months, well, really throughout most of the year. Uh, you know, even the sales here this uh, 
or the exports into uh, China during the month of August, I think a little 1.68 million metric tons, you know, which was reflective of those beans that were bought just before the last uh, negotiations or uh, what were hoped to be negotiations a year ago in August. Gosh, we were, you know, 275,000 metric tons. So, I mean, it, it, it is a marked increase, but still we'd have to consistently keep that moving to, uh, to make up for the lost ground in the last year. Dan, is there any indication of why China is stepping in now to make these purchases? You know, other than, yes, I, I do think, you know, they, as we as well, are anxious to try to uh, to get this trade war behind us. Uh, certainly is a, a goodwill gesture to do it. Uh, you know, that said, uh, we're probably getting to the point where South American beans are running the end of their course uh, as far as available supply, so they probably have to turn to the U.S. a little bit more. Uh, one other interesting note in China right now, and of course this comes back to, there's a two-edged sword here. We all know what the issue has been in China with the African swine fever this year and the, uh, the impact that's had on the hog herd. But, you know, of course we know it has really escalated the price of pork in China. So as any livestock producer would do, if you're one of the fortunate ones that still has a, uh, you're still producing pork or producing beef or whatever the case may be, you're going to try to capitalize the most you can. Well, it turns out that the, uh, the Chinese pork producers are really pushing the weights higher on uh, what's coming to market. You know, usually they're about 220, 250 on, on uh, weights coming to market. A lot of hogs coming in over 300 pounds at this point. And of course, we all know when you feed animals to, live, uh, to heavier weights, the feed conversion drops, so you end up using more corn, you end up using more soybean meal. So I think that also could be giving them just a little bit of boost in the, uh, for the demand for the products over there. Dan, since you brought up the lean hog market, they had a almost 16% jump in prices compared to last week. Was it because of Chinese buying or other reasons? You know, I, I think optimism of Chinese buying that uh, they think it, that's going to come about. I, I, I do think when you look at the livestock sector as a whole, you know, since going back to the beginning of September when we really were in the, uh, the basement on both cattle and hogs, I think part of this is a... Uh, is a response to that, you know, kind of a short covering type of rally. Even that short covering could be a lot from the hedges. I, I think the difficult thing there is when you look into the time of the year we're at, I mean, this is not really when you think about expansion in uh, meat demand, on, at least on a domestic standpoint. So, uh, yes, there could be some hope with, you know, one with China, of course, you know, possibly as a, uh, as a buyer of meats. Uh, you know, of course, after the, uh, the Japanese trade package this week, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I think it's more psychological than it is anything of reality. So I think it's going to be pretty difficult to probably see these markets extend higher from where they've already done here in the last uh, week and a half, two weeks. And when you look at the protein markets, let's talk live cattle here for a mm -hmm. second. They also had a huge move this week, 11 plus percent. Sure. Was it the Japanese trade deal or other news that sparked that big rally? You know, I mean, certainly the Japanese trade deal is, again, I think a very good psychological factor that helped uh, may maybe scare the shorts out of the market. I, I don't know if it's going to be able to carry it much more because one, yes, it is an incremental deal. We aren't going to see immediate necessarily cuts. Yeah, you, you know, it does. It, you, even in the statement earlier, this brings the playing field back to something level. Uh, and of course, I mean, what's, what we've just done now is caught up to everybody else who signed the TPP agreement uh, in 2017. So it did, it did level us out, thankfully for that. But we still have one uh, major factor that is a... Uh, is a detriment to all of these markets when it comes to the export season, and that's the strong dollar. The dollar charged into higher highs again this week, and you know I think as long as we continue to combat that, we're not going to capture that kind of market share that we really potentially could, even with these kind of trade packages. The feeder cattle markets didn't have maybe quite the gains that mm -hmm. the live cattle and hogs did, but they still had some positive gains on the week. Was that the live cattle complex pulling the feeder cattle up with it? I think live cattle complex pulling your feeder up. Also, the the idea that the corn market is just flat, it's dead, and you know there's a you know you're starting to look for alternatives to uh, uh, to. Uh, Look for markets for ways to move your corn to the marketplace. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll see a little bit something better in the placements. But, but here again, too, the, uh, uh, you know, we really just returned the cattle market to where they could lock in some profitability. So it, uh, uh, boy, it's, uh, you know, it's not like it's going to uh, really change that demand situation dramatically, you know, other than those that are, you know, just consistent cattle feeders. And are the feeder cattle then comfortable at these levels? Any reason to 
break out, continue breaking out, I should say, one side or the other. I, you know, not that we couldn't carry through, with, carry through just a little bit further to the upside, but, but here again, I think it's limited. I think it's just that time of the year. We know there's going to be a lot of cattle that need to come off of pasture at this point, at this time of the year, so availability ought to be pretty strong. So to, to see it accelerate much further, I think, is questionable. Dan, your brief thoughts. Last week we had the Saudi Arabian oil attacks. Mm -hmm. We traded that news this week. Has it been factored out of the markets? You know, it, it certainly has settled down dramatically from where it was. And, and really, it was a, a one-day reaction in the crude oil markets. Now, granted, we gradually came back down from there. So, uh, you know, that there were... Uh, uh, one, I, I would imagine that a lot of measures have been taken to try mm -hmm. to secure things because there was a lot of discussion. There were additional attack, attacks that had been planned since that hasn't happened. And, and realistically, coming into that point, we, we had a very ample supply okay. of oil domestic or globally. All right. So, yeah. All right. Dan Huber, thank you so much. Certainly. Thank you. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but we will keep this conversation going on Market Plus, where we'll answer more of your questions. You can find it on our website at markettomarket.org. Watch our analysis, online exclusives, and entire program via our YouTube channel of Market to Market. Join us again next week when we'll break down the latest major government reports with a panel of our analysts. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Delaney Howell. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Pioneer Hybrid International is a proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. AccuSteel, offering fabric covered buildings specifically designed for the cattle industry since 2001. The next generation of cattle buildings. Information at AccuSteel.com.